Hello and welcome everyone. Good afternoon or good morning, good evening, wherever you are in the world. We'll give it another few seconds for people to join us here in the Zoom room. We are also broadcasting live to the AIGA Design LinkedIn, Facebook, and YouTube channels. You can check us out there or watch the replay. If you're watching the replay, hello from the past. Thank you for joining us in the future. My name is Li Shan Huang, Director of Design Content and Learning here at AIGA, the Professional Association for Design. This is One Designer, One Work, our monthly series where we feature one designer showcasing a piece of work that is personally meaningful to them. We hear about what inspires, challenges, and guides them in their work. So before I introduce our special guest presenter for today, a quick reminder, a friendly reminder about our code of conduct, keep it clean, keep it kind, and we will be fine. If you have any questions about that, you can refer to that on AIG.org to learn more about that code of conduct, but everyone's been good so far, but I have to remind everybody every time. All right, so now on to our guest. Brockett Horn is a writer, designer, and educator. She's a faculty member at MICA, the Maryland Institute College of Art in Baltimore, where she teaches studio history and theory courses. She's, previ she's previously served on the AIGA Design Educators Community Steering Committee, and she is a co-director of the People's Graphic Design Archive, a crowdsourced online platform that enables new and expanded stories about graphic design history. You can find her online at brockethorn.design. Brockett will be speaking today about historical and contemporary pharmaceutical packaging. So over to you, Brockett, with the presentation, and I'll be back, as always, to host the Q&A. So post in the Q&A or in the chat if you have any questions, and I'll help facilitate that later. All right, over to you. Yeah, thank you so much. I'm so delighted to join you today. Um, I want to thank AIGA. You have sustained a design community that's been important to me for decades. Uh, we know more than ever how important community is, and you've been there for me at so many transitions when I was leaving college and becoming a professional, when I was changing cities, when I was learning about UX design, when I was trying to figure out how to teach. And even more recently, when we've all been kind of asking really important questions that challenge the very discipline that you represent. So AIGA, thank you so much for being there um, for us uh, for many years. I'm here with humbleness and respect. Um, and thanks, Lee Sean and Susan, for the amazing programming that you're doing in unprecedented times. So I'm going to share my screen, of course. And if you'll just give me, let me know if you're having any trouble with the tech while I pull it up. I'm gonna talk about pharmaceutical packaging um, and I hope that you save some questions for me um, so that we can have a good conversation at the end. So how's that look? Look okay? Okay, cool, cool. So my object is a bandit sign and I'm hoping to spin a world of design for pharmaceuticals around this object which I found zipped to the light posts on my street in Baltimore where I live. And I'm hoping that looking at this object can help me learn more about American healthcare through design. The most important thing that I'm gonna say in this session is that I am not a doctor nor a pharmacist and there's no medical advice in this talk. So if there's anything that sounds like a qualification of any kind of drug or medication, it's really misguided on my part. Um, and that's not what I mean to communicate. As always, I'm here for the fonts. So with that, um, let's talk about this typography. So it's very clear that the designer of this sign had a typographic strategy to attract our attention. Each section of this text is as big as it can be, even if that meant stretching it or adding poor tracking, but it allows the text to fully cover its space allocation. Each bit of text has a different type style from all caps to outline drop shadowed Helvetica. And there's even Pantone 021 standard orange, which is vibrating here with the same intensity of a detour or under construction sign. So the layout really isn't dissimilar to early letterpress posters, sort of the same logic with all the text centered and kind of maximized in its spatial zone. Each bit of the composition is chock full of information. 
And all of these factor, factors are capturing my curiosity with the phrase suboxone doctor. What is a suboxone doctor and what kind of a doctor would advertise with gator board? These are some questions that I was sort of asking. So of course I called the number and I spoke with a very kind person and patient who insisted three times that this would be just like a regular doctor's appointment, close actually to my real doctor's office, and it would help cure addiction. Um, Suboxone would cost me about $150 a month out of pocket, my insurance wouldn't cover it. And I was curious about this and this way of advertising for this kind of healthcare. So I began collecting a series of designed objects related to pain management and in particular opioids. And I'm curious what these objects reflect about pain um, how the design of medicines, maybe both prescription and over-the-counter, reflect larger values of health. So, of course, my pursuit of learning more about this took me to CVS, where I bought so many packages of acetaminophen that a manager was called over to check my ID and make sure that it was legit and ring up my purchases. Um, so, re, you know, research looking at, at over-the-counter medications. I also spoke with medical professionals. I imagined my own relationship to medications and did a little research where I found that the global pharmaceutical packaging market is valued today at almost $120 billion. At my own local CVS, it's been remodeled this year to make room for a COVID boutique, which has testing and um, vaccinations and et cetera. And to do that, they drastically condensed my beloved magazine rack and they eliminated a lot of the stationery to make more room for bottles. So Suboxone, it treats a narcotic dependence, but it's controversial. Um, two drugs, buprenorphine and naloxone work chemically to decrease opioid addiction. It's manufactured by Reckitt Bankheiser, now known as Indivior, um, which has been ordered to pay the US government $1.4 billion to resolve multiple investigations related to marketing. The Department of Justice alleged that Indivior illegally marketed Suboxone as a safer and less addictive substance compared to similar drugs containing the same active ingredients. Purdue Pharma, is another company in an ongoing lawsuit for mismarketing and bad design. Suboxone marketing was really key. It was a key detail in one of Purdue Pharma's many lawsuits and um, bankrupts. You know, currently they're going through a bankruptcy process. And in, in their case, an internal memo was leaked, and that memo uh, described considering selling Suboxone or distributing it. And the memo read, and I quote, "It is an attractive market." large unmet need for vulnerable, underserved and stigmatized patient population suffering from substance abuse, dependence and addiction. So in some ways, um, well, per, let's first say Purdue's main product is the highly addictive pain medication oxycodone for which Suboxone could be considered a counterweight um, as might have been considered in the memo. Oxycodone comes from opium of the poppy plant, which is the same natural substance from which heroin is made. And it was branded in 19, 1996 as OxyContin, and it was first marketed to non-cancer patients with chronic pain. And that's a really big market, non-cancer patients with chronic pain in a growing market, actually. So Purdue, to market OxyContin, Purdue collected strategic data um, to influence physicians to prescribe OxyContin. Drug companies in general target and profile individual physicians, and they can collect really sophisticated data points to build marketing strategies. According to one of the reports that I read, one of the critical foundations of Purdue's marketing plan was to target physicians who were the highest prescribers for opioids, but unfortunately, the same database would also identify which physicians were simply the most frequent prescribers of opioids. Um, and in some cases, they could be the least discriminate prescribers, right? So that they might, they might be prescribing it for a variety of reasons. 
Um, the FDA regulates the advertising and promotion of prescription drugs and is really responsible for ensuring that they are truthful, balanced, accurately communicated, well-designed, and regulations have uh, specific attributes for packaging. All packaging designs have to be submitted to the FDA for review when the materials are initially disseminated, but the FDA has a limited number of staff for reviewing these materials. So, um, and let me also say, there is no distinction in the act between marketing controlled and non-controlled drugs regarding the oversight of promotional activities, but you'll see in my presentation some differences in how drugs are packaged for prescription use, for hospital use, for doctors, for pharmacists, and we can talk about that later in the presentation. I haven't been able to find much information about who came up with the name and logo for OxyContin. Um, but we can see that one rule from the FDA is that the brand name is listed on um, the package itself, as well as the generic name or um, active ingredient. So both have to be there. And um, in this case, we can see oxycodone, hydrochloride, and oxycontin both kind of prominently featured on the bottle. There's also an icon iconography system that's on pharmaceutical packaging that includes a controlled substance schedule. Here it looks like a, a capital C with Roman numerals. And this system um, describes insight, I guess, on whether drugs have been currently accepted in medical use and treatment. It can describe their relative abuse potential and the likelihood of causing independence. This is reviewed annually and published annually. Um, just for example, cannabis is a one, ketamine is a three, and as you can see here with OxyContin, it is a two to describe its controlled substance schedule. Um, there's lots of other information on the packaging too. Labels are required to include the dosage, the size of the pill, disclaimers, the manufacturer, the expiration date, and so on. There's hardly enough room on the label to fit all of the text. Leaves a little room for graphics or negative space. In fact, this bottle of OxyContin um, has so much more information that it's crammed into a publication. <laughs> it's kind of wadded into a little spitball that is um, adhered to the back of the bottle. In this case, it's almost as thick as wide, as thick and as wide as the object itself. So this user's manual is intense. It <laughs> takes up more space than let's say like an atlas or a newspaper. Who would read this? And she who could read it, who could comprehend all of this information? Um, even I had trouble kind of parsing through it. But something that struck me about it is that in the same printed jargon, diff multiple users are addressed from the doctor who might be prescribing this to the pharmacist who might be filling it to the person who's digesting the medication. So this is sort of a catch all kind of a eight point condensed type publication. So much for user-centered design. Um, however, in the case of OxyContin, the label did include a very significant phrase that has been used in the lawsuit. And the phrase read, delayed absorption is believed to reduce the abuse liability. So OxyContin was presented as less addictive than other opioids using the logic that the ingredients could be metabolized slowly rather than rapidly and such a belief contributed to America's opioid crisis. And of course it was swag. So um, more than just description, descriptive promotions are persuasive about the product and features and brand recognition really comes into play in the aughts. Um, uh, Purdue Pharma had a, a pretty hefty bonus system that encouraged sales reps to increase their sales. Here's some hilarious promo pieces. Some of these you can still find on eBay if you're in the market. In, uh, including a mix CD that encourages us to swing in the right direction with OxyContin, a pedometer that encourages stepping in the right direction, maybe a bucket hat for carefree days, and of course, branded pens of different colors and, and different, different styles. According to one report from about 20 years ago, annual bonuses for sales reps average $71,000, which would be more than, um, the salary of a typical uh, sales rep. 
Um, and in 2001, Purdue paid 40 million in bonuses to sales representatives. So this is, this is you know, it's a big part of their project. And even though the designs that I'm sharing with you now, you know, the typefaces and the colors and the, the imagery, it's not going to inspire my students. <laughs> um, they were effective. You know, this was really effective design. In fact, OxyContin became kind of the most prescribed and abused opioid in the United States. So um, the naming of pharmaceuticals is a topic that's a little bit outside of this talk, but I think it's still worthy of consideration. And last year, um, I giggled at an advertisement for a contraceptive called Fexi with a PH. Maybe you saw that one too. Um, I'd really love more information about how these names are created. And, and maybe someone on the call knows it will be fun to talk about that at the end. But these are some of Purdue Pharma's product logos, Butrans, High Single, Nalphamine. Um, such names kind of make the active ingredient sound more corporate and maybe safer or more controlled or more manufactured. Um, and I don't find I didn't find any serif or script typefaces, only sans serifs, many of them distorted, and lots of language to kind of describe these brands. Very few of these uh, medications have space for icons or marks since the type marks include so much text information, the brand name, the active ingredient, the controlled substance icon, um, which is also distorted and presented in different proportions um, throughout its language and other, other qualifiers. So um, even the pills are printed, just like tickets or posters or boarding passes. The names here, um, you know, the, the brand or trade names might be included in the packaging, but might not necessarily be on the pill. So there's, there's a pretty complex system of pill iconography that leaves a complicated but decipherable legend. Um, and there are many databases if you need one to identify a pill. So this slide shows some images from one of the many pill identifier indexes that can help people kind of chase a wayward pill back to its package or back to its box to understand what it's for. And all of these numbers, shapes, and colors really make for a huge library of designed medicine. I'm kind of curious about this. This is um, a, my current um, multivitamin. And I feel like the shape, color, and texture of the pill itself is a really important factor in creating our relationship to medicine. What do you imagine when you ingest a pill? Like, what do you think, you know, what, what are you imagining? I personally really prefer the oval slippery capsule um, of my probiotic over the chalky kind of powdery big um, sphere shape of my multivitamin. It's easier to digest and somehow more palatable for me when I'm thinking about what's making me healthy. Ritual, the company that I'm sharing with you, the slide, um, takes the design of the pills to a new level by allowing us to see inside the pill itself, making the pill itself transparent and including all of these tiny micro particles that create the simulation that uh, of all the things that are within the pill. Uh, let's see. This is a um, subscription-based service, like you know many startup companies. And the the medicine itself, really separate from the package, is an important factor. Ritual uses not really a label so much as the design of the pill itself to compel customers. So you can see in, in the bottle on the right, there's a clear transparency so you can, you can see the, the pill itself instead of it being obscured by a lab text. According to a market analysis report, growing penetration of retail pharmacies and a rising focus on brand enhancement and product differentiation will fuel market growth for pharmaceuticals at almost 10% until 2030. In the US, we also have the 21st Century Cures Act, which is fueling medical product development. And the World Health Organization is reporting that by 2050, the proportion of the world's population over age 60 will in fact double, almost double. So other factors for the proliferation of different kinds of medical design include an increased need for medications because of the prevalence of, of chronic diseases, changing lifestyles, eating habits, alternate sleep cycles. And as you can see in some of these slides, packaging types include things like rigid bottles, flat pouches, stand-up packages, sachets, 
blister packs and um, custom canisters. So my um, back to my multivitamin, this is the, the user manual from Ritual, which I'm comparing to the OxyContin user manual. It's, it's unique. Um, and I think it's showing maybe, you know, how this could be branded in a boutique way. The accompanying user's manual shows not just the contents of each pill, but where the ingredients are coming from, as if this is a farm to table concept. <laughs> so my own uh, omega-3 comes from Saskatoon, Canada. And as I mentioned, this is a, a subscription, not a prescription system of vitamins and probiotics. And so every month I get a beautiful design from printed documents to even the unboxing itself is reminiscent of a tech product. It's entirely branded. Even the name ritual kind of claims that taking a multivitamin is, is a ritualistic experience. So to further explore the branded quality of medications, I wanted to share a few curious examples from history in which the organization authentically sourced the active ingredients. So this example comes a century before OxyContin. It's shaker anodyne, a painkiller produced from opiates, uh, which I found at the um, Philadelphia Museum of Art when on a very cool NEH trip with a group of design historians. And I was just struck, like the OxyContin bottle and even my original Suboxone sign, it's dense with information. The Shaker Pharmaceuticals were really trusted and sought out by consumers from their earliest sales, which were in the 1800s. And the um, packaging for Shaker medicines really played a pivotal role in establishing their credible reputation by linking the medicines through design to other well-known and trusted Shaker products like these. Um, Today, these, you know, maybe when you're thinking about the shaker lifestyle, you're imagining their beliefs of dancing, celibacy, hard work as prayer. Shakers are respected for creating a legacy of decorative arts. And botanical medicines were just one of their many commercial activities from Bentwood oval boxes, which I received as a wedding gift, <laughs> to uh, wooden furniture. Some of this inspired mid-century modernism. And when we're, I think when we're talking about the shakers, much attention is really paid to the pristine craftsmanship, formal ingenuity, and just pure austere beauty of their decorative arts. Um, and in this slide, you can see uh, one of the gardens in Mount Lebanon, New York, where they grew um, uh, all different kinds of seeds, all different kinds of um, uh, medicinal herbs that they used for their packaging. Some of it they grew on site and some of it they um, licensed. But check out the typography of their medicinal products. <laughs> so um, a medicine package in some ways is a sign of hope. The, the label promises healing. I think as one editor described the Shaker products as honest, sober, industrious, um, the covers of their boxes fit, their brooms sweep, and their packets of herbs are approved by physicians. Um, his understanding is really informed by the dependable functionality of Shaker products. And then to me, that's kind of contrasting with the quality of design on these packages. I think there are two promises kind of in tension with each other, a relief from sickness through mood altering narcotics, but also the assurance of peace, free of complexity as modeled by the Shaker lifestyle. Unlike the timelessness and classic beauty of the furniture, the typography is firmly situated in the styles and trends of its time. Shakers were marketers too, and they even licensed their brand name to subcontracting medical manufacturers. For sake of time, I can't talk about that too much, but um, these are some cool examples of Shaker products that were licensed, the Shaker name was licensed to other manufacturers. Okay. So just to round this out, um, I wanted to show five of my finds from the CVS shopping spree, just for comparison and discussion. These are all pain medications and they're all sold over the counter. And I chose this array because there's something curious to me about the packaging and the product. And I'm, um, you know, I'd love to talk to you about that, particularly if there's anyone on the call who has experience designing such packages, I'd be delighted to hear your experiences. But I loved this homeopathic migraine relief package really for a couple of reasons. 
One, it's watercolor painted branch, kind of sneaking up the side and reminding you that it's a natural product. The, the name here, it's a really clear name that describes its function, migraine relief. And then the list of ingredients of things that are not in the package. So it's unclear from the front of the box exactly what is inside, but there's no acetaminophen, there's no ibuprofen, there's no caffeine. Um, but we trust somehow that this natural product could heal us kind of based on the design and its association with nature, perhaps. So I thought that was kind of interesting. And then as a contrast to that would be the CVS brand acetaminophen, which is similar in that we can't really know what is in this red syrup, but boy, does it signal effectiveness. Um, what a vibrant cocktail. In fact, it's labeled rapid burst cherry flavor. And we can see on the lower right of the label, there's a happy golden heart that's kind of emanating relief from any kind of pain. But I do like that the, the bottle itself is transparent and we can actually see exactly what's inside. I don't know if we can make sense of what we can see, but you know, we know that it's gonna be a red uh, syrupy liquid. But you can also see on the top of this bottle, the um, plastic seal around the top. So um, uh, counterfeiting and assuring um, uh, effective uh, protecting the product through its supply chain is also a really important part of pharmaceutical packaging. So um, another fun find was this one. This is a very branded option with the same kind of typography that we see in lifestyle branding. Midol offers several products for pain relief. This one's Midol Complete. It, it's meant for any use, multi-symptom relief. And its simplicity and bright colors stood out on the shelf. This was really low on the shelf. Um, at my CVS, all the CVS branded offerings were really at eye level. But this one caught my attention even just because of the, the amount of negative space and the, the quality of the color on the package. And then this one, the goodies, um, mixed fruit blast powder. This is baby boomer, boomer brands. So this is my grand, grandfather's recommendation. And here, I think it's been redesigned to look like a sports supplement for a new generation. There's lots of motion implied here by the type and image treatment. It's almost like your pain can be whisked away in a sort of fruity swipe, um, like a, a bottle of Gatorade or something like that. And then this one was curious. This is um, another package that's sort of nodding to candy or food packaging. It's B&B's Tic Tac-like dispenser. This would be really easy to store in a purse or glove compartment. And the pills kind of rattle around in the container in the same way that Altoids or Tic Tacs kind of rattle around in their container. So to me, this one, the sound is part of the design and kind of makes it enjoyable like a musical instrument or something. The um, container itself has ergonomic features that relates to the hand and makes it easier to open and also keep firmly shut. And it's calling to mind to me here, the work of Deborah Adler for Target's Clear RX, which I don't have a lot of time to talk about today, but you can read more of her amazing thesis work, which was about um, product design and graphic design related to pharmaceuticals at adlerdesign.com. And then the last example I have, I ordered. So this comes from Cabinet Health, which is an online pharmacy dedicated to offering affordable medicine to Americans. And their tagline is making getting better, better. And this um, package offers stackable modular canisters with a pretty extensive color and type system. So it kind of reminds me in some sense of like Tupperware or um, a spice rack. You know, you're meant to collect different kinds of medications to fully outfit your home. And it, you can, might be able to see the label on the small canister in the front is magnetic. So it's pretty easy to kind of pop them off and reuse them. And um, I thought it was an interesting example. The, um, this package also, uh, there's a lot of information about the sustainability of these types of packages on um, the website for Cabinet. So my hope in sharing all these images is really just to kind of give you a roundup of what's possible and maybe impossible as we think about designing for healthier lives and to kind of think about ways that through our design, we can make relationships with our medicines and therefore how we think about our health. I have a hefty sense of resources or sources if you want to learn more. Um, you know, I'm happy to share with you my bibliography. It was fun to read about this, and it's a fun topic because it weaves through design and um, branding and, and packaging and, and sculpture and art and um, all different kinds of things, but I'm happy to share this. So 
that's what I brought. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Brockett, for that presentation. We have about 15 minutes for Q&A. So I wanted to invite our audience members to go ahead and type your questions in the chat or in the Q&A pod, and I can read them out for Brockett. And while you think about what you want to ask, I will kick things off with the first question. So thank you again for that overview of these the history and the different kinds of pharmaceutical uh, packaging designs. I'm curious about the regulation part of things. I think you touched upon it with the different schedules and things like that, but it seems like there's yet another layer, right? There's the consumer facing, there's the uh, healthcare provider facing like for the doctors and, and the pharmacists. And then there's also the things that are just mandated by law. And so how do you think about the, I guess, the additional challenges, the additional stakeholder uh, there in terms of uh, public policy that the designers of these products have to think about? Yeah, I mean, it's a great question. And I think it's, thank you for it. Um, I think that it's very clear that some of these regulations put a uh, the um, burden on the consumer or the burden on the purchaser to comprehend complex information. We see this not just in design for medications, but in lots of places right now where, you know, the regulation or the rule is that you must include the brand name, the active ingredient, the um, uh, uh, manufacturer, there's all these things. And therefore that creates something that's convoluted and really challenging to present in a hierarchical, easy to manage um, way. And um, it's striking to me that the, qual the quality of the design, you know, it, it, it impacts the design, that it's really hard to make all that digestible. So I described, you know, the user manual for a bottle of OxyContin. It's like a 60 page booklet, you know, that's presented as, as like a tiny piece of paper that kind of folds out and opens up. And it, that could be presented in a much more digestible way. But who, honestly, like who, who is going to spend all that time with it? So I worry about this, right? Like I, I understand that the regulations insist that the information is transparent, um, but at the same time, it isn't, it isn't presented in an intelligible way. That said, there in, in the two um, lawsuits that we're looking at, a lot of, of information, a lot of time was spent on promoting these and marketing these products in ways that are nefarious, right? Or problematic. And um, but maybe the investment in, in presenting design that's intelligible and useful isn't to the same extent that marketing or, or um, encouraging uh, doctors to prescribe it is. So I don't know if that's like a, a good response, but it, I mean, it's clear that it's a burden on the designers who are trying to combine typefaces and point sizes and, and things like that for sure. Right. It's sort of like, it reminds me of the pharmaceutical ads, right? Where they have the announcer usually has to go like rapid fire to talk about like all of the possible side effects, including, you know, bleeding and potentially death or whatever. Right. And that's like, I mean, that's a real concern. I mean, it sounds uh, funny and ridiculous, but the way that they have to just kind of squeeze it in there, say for a, a 30 second spot, it does come across as both serious and absurd at the same time. It's hilarious. We, you know, we could watch an ad and it, it will all of a sudden, like the last 20 seconds of the ad, it feels like it's been sped up 200% speed or it's, eight, you know, eight point condensed type being read aloud kind of thing. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And it's also, I think, uh, a pretty uniquely US American kind of issue, right? I know for our international friends, a lot of other countries don't allow like consumer focused advertising of pharmaceuticals in the same way as certainly of prescription drugs. Yeah. Um, am I cutting off a question? I'm just. Changing. Oh no, no, no please. Okay. Um, with the shakers, right? So with um, I should say there were there have been a couple of important FDA acts. So the shakers, the historic examples that I showed you, were print, most of them were printed and reproduced before a very important FDA act of 1906, which changed um, a lot about how um, it, it kind of eliminated what what we could call like patent the, the presentation of patent medicines or quack medications, snake oil kinds of things. Um, and there is an example of some of the shaker products that literally have the word poison printed on top of them, like same label. And, and to me, that's similar to kind of the way cigarettes might be packaged today, right? Like, um, you know, now if you go out and buy a pack of cigarettes, the little warning, right, or, or the disclaimers are bigger than the branding or, or, or bigger than um, any other information about what's in the box. That kind of becomes a part of the design or it just becomes 
uh, normalize in, in the presentation of a product. So I'm checking out the q and I just wanted to address some of our live streamer, uh, the folks in LinkedIn. Doesn't look like there's any questions yet on LinkedIn, but there are some comments. Um, Natalie just wanted to thank you for mentioning the sustainability aspect. Um, Stephen wanted to, to say that he appreciated your inclusion of the vintage medicine bottle design. And then we also had John chiming in to say that prescription pharmaceutical names are usually based on something to do with the chemical compound. And uh, folks can check out the Pfizer website. They do have a quick uh, post about some of that. And as an aside to that, I did meet a linguist at a conference like years ago who specialized in naming these sort of things. And so there's also like a sort of sociolinguistic process uh, for some of these things as well. Cool. Um, all Thanks right. for those comments. It's great to hear. Sure thing. All right. We have a proper question now from Victoria in the q and I'll just read it off. Uh, Victoria wants to know, do you think the transparency and simplicity of the ritual branding is a reaction to a distrust of quote unquote big pharma, as well as perhaps the idea of, of clean eating? It seems notable that the pills are designed to have a quote unquote natural color. Yeah, Victoria, thanks for the question. I, I agree, and um, thanks for noticing that. Actually, um, I labored a lot over that photograph because my camera captured it with even more yellow than it was. So I tried to Photoshop it more to capture the the true quality of the product, which is a little bit whiter. It's a little bit, but it but it is like um, a kind of beige-ish color. Yeah, yes, to answer your question. However, I'm skeptical of it as well, personally, because I feel I admire and appreciate this idea for transparency. We're showing you exactly what's inside of this pill, where we get it from, and the pill itself and the bottle itself are literally transparent so that you can see it. But it's also really contrived. Like there's no way that that could actually be so beautiful. You know, there, there's absolutely no way that that um, tiny little thing could be composed of such beautiful confetti, so to speak. Um, and I, so for that reason, I'm, I'm mistrustful of it. It's yet another like branded or, or super controlled thing, even though it does definitely point to mistrust of big pharma and clean eating for sure. Thank you for that response. Uh, we have another audience comment, less of a question, but uh, more of a fun musing. Marisa says, I find it interesting how the visual language of pharmaceuticals and over-the-counter sold in organic stores um, like Moms or Roots creates different shopping experiences than say a regular chain store like a Safeway or a CVS because more of these ingredient transparent products aren't advertised uh, as heavily. Mm. Yeah, interesting musing. Um, thanks for that, Marisa. Um, yeah, super interesting. I think, um, the thing that's coming to mind for me is what we'll call like a store branded thing, like um, in Whole Foods, the 365 brand, or even like in my case, the CVS branded items are often then in small text will say compare to this, right? Or it's, it's the whole concept of the product is in direct relationship to something else. So it's meant to be compared to something else and therefore made to me often cheaper, but better like organic instead of non or um, you know, more affordable rather than expensive. But yeah, I think you're right that there is this idea that it, it could be in your case with the organic stores that those things might, might be healthier for you for sure. Yeah, and thinking about it, that really says something about the power of branding and name brands in particular, right? Because the like the CVS store brand, it's like literally the same thing for this generic over the counter. And it's also on the shelf and it's like, you can see that the price is usually cheaper, if not always cheaper, yet there's still that power of these brands, like somehow the branded one will be more effective where it's, I don't think the science is there for that, right? Unless there is some sort of like, uh, like what do you call that? Uh, um, the, uh, that like psychological effect. Yeah, for sure. All right, uh, Karma has a point here in the Q and A. Uh, first, Karma wants to say, great talk, Brockett. And then Karma writes, you pointed out that pretty much all contemporary medication labels are sans serif. I'm curious then what you think that Suboxone Doctors is centered serif all caps. Does that imply some kind of traditional or natural or even anti-establishment remedy? Just wondering what you make of that initial gator board sign in light of how other medicine marketing materials look. 
such a good question. Thank you for that. Um, so let me also say um, part of it is where I found that sign too. So it's right by a bus stop. So it's definitely right by a bus stop, which um, the particular bus stop is in a part of the city that has lots of city services. So there's lots of healthcare, there's lots of clinics, um, there's lots of um, services, lots of people who are walking around using public transit. So I don't read it as anti-establishment because of that, because of like where I found it. I should also note that it was um, not vinyl. So when I first grabbed it, I assumed it was gonna be vinyl letters. And that was why it was the, I figured it was like sans serif stretch type because that was what the vinyl shop had on hand. Like you order this kind of sign online and you choose from five or six fonts, but it was, um, I actually don't know the process, but it was all applied. So it was like a heat transfer on the gator board itself. It does, however, look so much like the kind of work that my students are making right now, right? Which is anti-establishment um, for sure. But I believe it, I believe the sign itself not to be of that. I feel like it was, um, uh, I, I don't read it as ironic. I read it as sort of straightforward in the graphic style that's used. Disagree with me though. I, I'd love to hear your perspective too. <laughs> Yeah, and it also reminds me of like some of those like old style pharmacies. I mean, we, we still have a few of those around where I live in the Boston area where it's like they've been there since before the chains, although some of them have been like bought out by chains. So it's still a CVS, even though it like has the original kind of ye old times branding to it. But I don't think like any of the products you get on the inside are any different. It's more just like the outside of the storefront. Um, but I mean, good. it's a good point, right? Because I think like in some of the older pharmacies or compounders, right? Like it was even the um, brand name would be the person who you trusted to like mix together the different active ingredients for the prescription instead of selecting from an array of branded options, right? So I totally agree with you that you, you know, you in a, a small town context or uh, you might have like know your pharmacist and really trust him or her because of their methodology and their name um, less than the products that they stocked or, or um, I guess I made my point, but yeah, for sure. I totally agree. Totally. Or even at like my local CVS, they have like the picture and the name plaque of like the head pharmacist on duty at any given time, right? So it kind of personalizes this otherwise uh, very transactional experience. Um, this, I think, is the last comment, less than a question, but you're welcome to respond to it, Brockett. But Gunnar uh, is commenting in the chat here that there's an interesting tension in designing for store brands because the store chains want the packaging to look just like the name brand and the name brand people strictly enforce their trade dress rights. Uh, so it seems like there's this kind of battle uh, of attention and of branding right on our store shelves. Yeah, it's a good observation. And I actually don't, I'd love to know some data about that. I don't know a lot of information about, you know, the psychology of, of how to convince someone to choose the CVS brand or the Walgreens brand or the uh, Moms or Harris Theaters or Roots, what have you, instead of the name brand. But I know that the big pharma companies are doing a lot to manifest and maintain their, um, the branded names of their um, products, right? So it is a very interesting tension indeed. Wonderful. Well, thank you all audience members for your questions and comments. Thank you, Brockett, for that presentation and the Q&A again. A quick announcement, our June, uh, one designer, one work for June for next month will be Christine Scheller, who will be talking about Keith Haring and how his work, his legacy in reproducing and commercializing his art has helped her understand a what a career in design could look like. So looking forward to that next month. Um, thanks again, everybody. We'll post this recording very soon. So thanks for tuning in live or for watching the video. See you next month.